Let's do it. All right. Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to our pronunciation training. And today we are going to talk about intonation. We're going to talk about all the different aspects of intonation, rhythm, stress, all the different aspects of prosody. Okay. So if you're here, say hi in the comments. So I know that you're here and that you're excited about this. If you just joined us, and this is your first day, so just to give you some, to, to, to explain to you what is happening here. Um, I'm doing this five-day training to help you get some tools on how to get started with pronunciation work, because I believe pronunciation is critical if you want to speak English with clarity, confidence, and freedom. It is not just about how you sound, and it's not just about your accent. It's about owning a language and saying what you want to say with confidence, being understood so you can say what you think, what you feel like, and you can get what you want, which is also really, really important, right? And pronunciation can help you with that. I know that from my own personal experience and from having worked with over 10,000 students from around the world, different speakers, and I know pronunciation work. Okay, uh, just a sec, I need to add a moderator. There we go. Okay. Now I want to talk about intonation, but before that you probably, if you're on Instagram or if you're watching this on YouTube on, or on Facebook, you might see that, um, I wrote a co comment here inviting you to join my free masterclass, free live class that is happening next Tuesday. I have two sessions where I'm going to teach you how to take everything that I talk about in those five days and put it into practice, how to make your pronunciation in English simple and clear. I'm going to talk about why it's it always feels very tiring to speak in a second language, why that happens and how you can overcome it so you can energize your speech while improving your clarity. I'm going to talk about how to take what you learn and put it into practice so you can use it consistently and how to build a strong mindset and not avoid or feel fake or feel artificial when you're learning new sounds and when you're changing your, so your sounds. So all of that is really, really critical if you want to put into practice what I will be teaching you in those five days. The live class is absolutely free. It's on Tuesday. And if you want to get access to the live class, if you're on Instagram, just write the word class. If you're on Facebook, send me a DM, a private message actually with the word class. And if you're on YouTube, just click the link and sign up. Okay, good. All right, my friends. So today we're going to talk about intonation. Yesterday we talked about pronunciation of sounds. Before that, we talked about why pronunciation is so important. Everything is on my account. You can go back and see it if you haven't seen it. Um, have you been, if, if you attended one of my previous sessions, let me know in the comments. Put yes if you have and put no if you haven't, just so I know. Okay, let's see. Good. Intonation. And I say intonation because it's a more familiar and popular word. But intonation is really... Everything about the speech, and it's not intonation. I want to use a bigger word. I want to use the word prosody. Prosody includes in it intonation, but also rhythm and connected speech and stress and phrasing and tone of voice and all the elements of speech that are not specifically the speech sounds. So when we think of pronunciation, you know, we think of the R and the TH and the sheep ship, but I could be speaking with the right pronunciation. So all my sounds are accurate, but there is still something unnatural about my speech when I speak like that. Why is that? Because I disconnected the sounds. I disconnected the words. I My intonation was absolutely flat. Now, people usually don't speak that way. It sounds very robotic but I just wanted to illustrate how, why prosody with that intonation, rhythm, stress, connected speech is so important because 
the way our brain likes to receive messages goes beyond the words and beyond the sounds. It really has, you know, like a language is something very emotional. When we listen to someone, we hear their voice and their voice is not just, just where their voice resonates, but it's also how it's being used. The intonation, the tone of voice. Does it sound sarcastic? Does it sound angry? Does it sound friendly? Right? And all of that is the music of the language. And it's under the umbrella of prosody. So today I want to teach you some of those elements so that you can start paying attention to those elements if you haven't yet. Have you heard about prosody? Have you practiced connected speech before? Let me know in the comments if yes. And let's see. Okay. And we do have some people, a lot of you have attended my previous sessions, live sessions, and a lot of you haven't. So, and by the way, if you have any questions, don't be shy and just ask them in the comments. All right. Yeah. So we have some people with experience and some without. Good. Makes sense. 50-50. All right. So prosody, intonation, rhythm, stress. What is intonation? Intonation is the melody of the language. Now, you guys, I'm going to ask you to practice with me today. So make sure you are alone. You can make funny noises and sounds so that you can put what I teach you into practice. Okay. Um, <laughs> so intonation is the music of the language. If I were to speak on the same note, so every word would be on the same note, then my intonation would be flat or monotone because it's the same tone, right? It doesn't change whatsoever. Now, yes, there are people who speak that way. Not too many. There are languages that are more monotone than English. English is a very varied, versatile language. There are people who are monotone and have more of a flat intonation, native speakers of English as well. But pitch plays a significant role in English because this is how you stress specific parts of the sentence. So intonation is not just for it to sound interesting, even though... It also helps your voice and your, your, your speech sound more interesting because it's varied. But it's also a way to deliver a clear message. So intonation, really what it does is it helps you help the listener identify what's more important and what's less important. So I want to talk about these two elements that I just mentioned. One, when intonation is repetitive, monotone, or monotone could be when I speak with the same intonation and I don't change it whatsoever, no matter what I'm saying, right? So even though my intonation is very varied right now, it's still monotone because it's the same. It's kind of like copy, I'm copy pasting my music. And as listeners, when we hear a repeated pattern, what usually happens is that we tune out. We, I don't want to say get bored because it's not get bored, but especially these days when it's so hard to get people's attention, when someone speaks with this repetitive pattern, then people are less likely to pay attention for everything that they're saying. It's just how our brain works. It's kind of like, oh, we figured it out already, your pattern. And sometimes people might just get distracted by the pattern when it's too repetitive. So varying your intonation, whether it's in your first language or in English, is a great tool to be a better communicator. So no matter if you want to improve your intonation or your ability, your communication abilities in English or in your first language, this is an important lesson because every language can have a varied intonation and a less varied intonation. Okay? Good. So we want to vary our intonation so we're not repetitive, so we can keep the attention of the listener. But also, intonation is helping us convey our message. Why is that? In American English, in, in a given sentence, there are words that are stressed and words that are unstressed. 
I'm going to say it again. In a given sentence throughout your entire speech, if you are speaking in English, you will find that some words are stressed and some words are less stressed. There are two ways to stress words and to unstress words. And both of those ways, and we use both of them simultaneously, one is pitch and the other is rhythm or length. So I'm going to say it again. One is pitch, the pitch of your voice. That's one way for us to stress or unstress a word. And the other is rhythm or the length of the word. Okay. Now, if, um, I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to say a sentence and you are going to write down in the comments the word that you think I've stressed the most. Okay. Um, I'm going to say it. What do you think about it? What do you think about it? Which word did I stress? And then we'll, we'll look at what I said before and see what I meant. Good. Good. So most of you say think, some of you say it, some of you say about. I'm going to say it again the way I said it. What do you think about it? So, and you can also write down in the comments, you can see Christina, she wrote down, Christina from my team, she wrote down the sentence as I said it. When I say, when I give you these example sentences, try to understand what I'm saying and write the whole sentence in the comments. And of course, you can just put in caps the word that you think that I've stressed. I did stress the word think. So if you wrote think, you are right. I didn't stress about, I didn't stress you. I stressed think. What do you think about it? How did I stress think? First, I use pitch. Pitch is the tone of your voice. Okay. Higher pitch is higher notes. This is higher pitch. And this is lower pitch, high, low. Now, my pitch ranges between my high notes, right? Like a, a place that I can hit without straining my voice. High, right? High. If I go higher than this, high, it's going to strain my voice. So it's not going to be natural. But I could go really high when I'm explaining something. I use pitch when I want to stress something. And the higher I go, probably the more stressed the word is right? When I just said it now, the higher I go, so I went a little higher in pitch, but not too high. So the higher I go, now I went really, really high. So I use pitch, the tone of my voice, the frequency of my voice, when it's high frequency, then the pitch is higher, to emphasize something. I could also go significantly lower. What do you think about it? It's a little less common, but it's also like a significant pitch change from your normal range is indicating that I just stressed a word. So I use pitch to stress the word, but I also use length. What does that mean? I take the word think and I stretch it a bit. What do you think? Think about it. The vowel in the word think is a short vowel in finish limit, but I can stretch it a bit if I want to stress this word. What do you think about it? In addition to going higher in pitch and stretching the word, what did I do with the beginning part? What did that sound for, like for you? I'm going to say it again in slow motion. What do you think about it? If you had to write it in one word, the entire, the beginning of the phrase, and I'm going to show you, this is how I said it. Very good, Muhammad. Good. What are ya? What are ya? Right. What are ya? 
barely like hearing any vowels there. It's mostly consonants. What are you? Yeah, exactly. Someone said like it sounds like an R because it's a flap T. Good. So what are you? What do you think about it? What do you think about it? So not only that I'm raising the pitch, and there is a really good question here, so I want to make sure I don't forget it. Um, why do we need to stress words? So if you can comment on this in the meantime while I'm explaining, that would be great. Why do you think it's important to stress words? Write it in the comments and then I'll answer. So what are you? So we both raise the pitch and prolong the word that is stressed. And also we reduce everything that is less important, like the what do you. Now here's where the problem is. And this is why I think intonation is so important because it helps you understand speakers better and comprehension is key, right? Like if you're afraid of not understanding people doing this work, doing pronunciation work and prosody work in particular, working on reductions is going to help you significantly with understanding others because you'll be understanding it through your mouth. Not just like try to detect the differences. So what do you, what do you, what do you, what do you think, right? So we reduce the vowels in the words that are less stressed. They're called function words. I'm not going to go too deep into explaining them, but they're called function words. So they just, they're to, to help me with grammar and, and like all the prepositions and the verb be and the auxiliary verbs and the modal verbs, right? So all of those were the, the, this, that, of, in, they're reduced. What do you, what do you think about it? Now I'm going to say the same phrase and now I'm going to stress a different word. What do you think about it? What do you think about it? Which word did I stress? Okay, so while you are telling me which word do I stress, um, okay, so why do we stress words? So Crystal says to emphasize the important word. Um, Elena says to really understand the language and sound natural. Elena says to catch the meaning of the sentence or important things. And let's see her here on Instagram. Katya says, stressing words, we bring the attention to the words that convey our message and show our emotions. All right. Well done, you guys. Exactly. So the reason why we need to stress words versus reduce words is first, it's first of all, to simplify our message. I could be speaking like this without stressing any word, and then it would be hard for the brain to get it, right? Think of like reading a text. And let's say the text looks the same, or the text has parts of the sentence that are in bold, right? Or underlined, or even like a larger font. Your eyes are more likely to catch that. So the, the writer would be like, I want to make sure that you don't miss out that I just said something here, right? It's the same, but we do that with a voice. We help you understand where to focus. And also it's hard for the brain to understand ever, like if every word is separate, and this is why connected speech is important and reductions are important, then it's going to take a little longer for someone to understand you. Okay. So it's really a great way to convey a message and to point out what's important for us so that you understand your, our emotions, our attitude, and really the message. Usually words that are stressed are content words, nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, the words that have a meaning. The words that are unstressed, lower pitch, reduced, are function words. All the words that connect content words, on and at, could, would, should, she, he, was, were, have, has, at, the, right? Those words are not that critical because your brain would fill in the gaps, even if you don't say them fully. And English has a lot of word in, words in a sentence. So you kind of like make it easy for listeners to by, to understand by really focusing on the content words. And even within content words, I'm not stressing all of the content words. In the phrase that I just gave you, what do you think about it? Um, Okay, that's not a good example because there's only one content word. I'm going to give you another example in a second. Um, 
let's see. What did I stress before? You. Okay, good. Good, 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 good. So you could all hear. What do you think about it? And can you hear that there is a difference in the meaning when I say, what do you think about it? Stressing think versus what do you think about it? Stressing you. Can you hear a difference? Yes or no? Can you feel that it's a different question? And does it answer your question for why stressing words is important? Because the words are, I choose to stress impact my attitude and my meaning. Okay. I'm going to give you another example of, no, actually I'm going to explain the difference. What do you think about it? This is just like a natural question that I'm asking someone for their opinion, right? Let's say I'm asking, what do you think about it? I really want to get your opinion about, you know, what do you think about this bottle of water? All right. Or sparkling water. Hello to my people in Catalonia. By the way, I'm obsessed with this. Do you know this? Okay. So what do you think about it? What do you think about it? Right? So I'm just asking for your opinion. What do you think about it means that I've already heard some opinions from people. Oh, it's too salty. I don't like it. Okay, no, no, no. I don't want to know what she thinks about it. I, I want to know what you think about it. So what do you think about it, Hadar? right? That's when I would use you, right? I would put the emphasis on you. And then it's really, I'm not, I'm not interested in, well, I want to know what you are thinking about it, but the context is that I have other opinions, but I'm curious to know what you think about it because I'm going to invite you for dinner and I want to make sure that I have the right sparkling water for you. Okay. So another example, um, I'm not sure we're going to make it happen. I'm not sure we're going to make it happen. What word did I stress? And you can actually write the entire, let's make it a listening exercise. And you can tell me what I said. I'm not sure we're going to make it happen. There is a delay of like 15 minutes between the moment I say it and the moment I respond. Yes, happen. Very good. YouTube, Facebook, what are you saying? Happen. Good. I'm not sure we're going to make it happen. Another thing that I want you to pay attention to, this is like an advanced um, anecdote, but I want you to notice it. In English, every syllable is slightly higher or lower in pitch than the previous one. Usually, and that's our goal. It's not always the case. And there are not, like people who speak on the same tone, native and non-native speakers, right? So what I'm saying here is like a, a general rule for English and for English of speakers who are engaging, okay? I'm not sure we're going to make it happen. I'm not sure we're na 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 right? Have you noticed it? It's not, I'm not sure we're going to make it happen. There's always a shift. And this is why the, the speech is very versatile. But I also want you to be aware of it when you're practicing it. Because if this is not something that is natural in your language, for example, in my first language, Hebrew, Hebrew is a lot more monotone. And whenever you know, like, or when I used to practice and tried, like I tried to raise my pitch, that would feel artificial, right? Because that's not natural. However, I've trained myself to be more flexible with my voice because I realized this really helps me communicate in a better way. Okay. And by the way, by the way, if you just joined us, I'm going to teach you how to take what I'm teaching you here in the live class. I have a live class next Tuesday two sessions. It's a full hour where I'm going to teach you how to take everything that I'm telling you here 
and put it into practice. And I'm going to also teach you the obstacles that you might be facing and how to overcome them when you want to incorporate pronunciation work and when you want to make your pronunciation simple and clear. So if you're on Instagram, write the word class and sign up. If you're on Facebook, send me a private message with the word class and you're going to get a link. Automation is amazing. So it's a bot that's going to send you the link. It's not me sending you links right now. And if you're on YouTube, just click the link. Okay. So I'm not sure we're going to make it happen. That's, um, happen is the stressed word. Okay. So everything is kind of like reduced, lower pitch, happen is stressed. I'm not sure we're going to make it happen. I'm not sure we're going to make it happen. What did I stress here? I'm not sure we're going to make it happen, right? Maybe someone's going to make it happen, but it's definitely not going to be us, right? Can you hear the difference? Right. We're. We're. And also, I did say we are, right? And I reduced it. That's the thing about reductions. Okay. Another sentence. And now, what do I want to teach you? I'm going to teach, I'm going to talk about rhythm now. So I want to talk more about those reductions. The next sentence, I'm going to say it out loud and please write what you hear in the comments. My cousin and his wife are planning to come. My cousin and his wife are planning to come. What did I say? And I see that someone said, uh, I can only participate on Wednesdays. If you sign up, you will get the recording also. So even if you can't find the right time for you, just book a spot and you will get the recording, the replay to your inbox right after. Write the whole sentence of what I said. Good, Marissa. Are, nope, Almost. My my cousin and his wife are planning to come. Yes. So we did have planning. Pina, good. Good. Now, there are a few stressed words here. My cousin and his wife are planning to come. So come is probably the main word that is stressed here. But I now want to talk about the rhythm. Notice how the small words, the functional words are really short. If I were to pronounce all of them with the same beat, with the same rhythm, my cousin and his wife are planning to come. My cousin and his wife are planning to come. But what I did here is that some words were more reduced and I want you to practice it with me. My cousin and his wife, cousin wife, right? These are the two content words. Everything in between is reduced. My Cousin, Nana's, and his. Nana's, can you hear it? Nana's, my cousin, Nana's, because I drop the H, the I becomes a schwa. The word and is reduced to just N. My cousin, Nana's wife, fully pronounced, higher in pitch. I hope you're doing it with me. My cousin, Nana's wife, er, are, er, planning the planning to, planning to come. So the word to becomes de, are, er, and, un, his, is. No wonder it's so hard for people who don't have a lot of experience in English. No wonder that those people have a hard time understanding native speakers with all of these reductions. Because in school, we learn how to understand English word by word by word. And we expect to hear word by word by word. But what happens is that the word his becomes us and we don't know what that means. And the word and becomes just n without context. We don't know what that means. Of course, with context, it's easier. But when people speak fast, sometimes it's hard. So we need to start noticing that words are not fully pronounced. And the best way to do it is through practicing it. And this is what I do in my programs and and in my videos. I teach you how to do that, not just so that you start using the right rhythm, even though it's a great skill to have, but really because it helps you understand so much better. 
So it's reduced, right? Lower in pitch, but also, and this is where we go into connected speech, everything is grouped up as if it's one word. My brother and my, or cousin, my cousin and his wife, one unit, everything is connected. I'm not separating the words. It's not word by word. My cousin and his wife, do it with me. My cousin and his, my cousin and his, my cousin and his. It's kind of funny, right? My cousin and his, my cousin and his wife, my cousin and his wife are planning to come. A thought, think of thoughts, right? When you think something, I know it's hard to think about it, but try it with me. Like when you're creating a thought, you don't break it down into words. It's an idea pulled together. And when you read, let's say, you know, you're learning how to read and you read word by word by word, it's hard to understand the meaning of the entire sentence or idea. That's the same with speaking. So many people on with the attempt of sounding clear, they separate the words so that they are clearer. But actually what happens is that you're making yourself less clear than if you were to connect everything together because that's how the language is built. That's how people are expecting an idea or a thought to be delivered. Okay. There are languages that would separate the words. So that might be fine for that language. But in English, connected speech is everything. This is how, think about punctuation, right? If you were to see a text with no commas, no full stops, no quotation marks, no dashes, nothing, it would be really hard to get through the text. Think of intonation and connected speech as punctuation of your speaking. Okay. So when I take a small break or when everything's connected, you know, it's the same clause. When I take a small break, it's like a comma. When I take a longer break, it's like a full stop, right? So I use pauses. I stop the connected, the connection of the words and I use intonation up or down to show if something else is coming up or it's the end of a thought. Okay, good. I have one more thing to teach you, and then I'm going to answer questions. If you join me now, then um, hello. Today we're talking about prosody, more specifically, or, and if I want to get specific, then it's intonation, rhythm, stress, and connected speech, and tone of voice, which is what I'm going to talk about today, uh, now. Um, and... I want to invite you to a free live class that I'm hosting on Tuesday. If you want to get a link to sign up, it's absolutely free. I'm going to teach you how to make your English pronunciation simple and clear. Then just write the word class in the comments on Instagram. Send me a private message on Facebook with the word class or click the link on YouTube. All right. So the next thing I want to talk about is tone of voice. What did I say? Tone of voice. Write that phrase down so I make sure that you know what I just said. Tone of voice. And yes, this video is going to be available to watch later. Tone of voice. What is that? Mm. Tone, uh, almost, Hilda. I reduce the word there in the middle. Tone of voice tone of voice. It's the tone of the voice. What does that mean? What is tone? It's basically the attitude or the mood that is associated with your voice or with something that you're saying. Okay. So why is tone of voice important? And by the way, we have that in writing. If you've ever taken any writing lesson in the past, they always talk about tone of voice of writing, right? Is it formal? Is it friendly? Is it a um, memoir? Is it, you know, um, distant, right? Like, so tone of voice is very present in writing. Also when speaking, but people don't talk about it as much, unfortunately. Now I have trained as an actress. So for me, it was part of the work that I did 
when, you know, preparing for a role, like understanding the tone or and the situation and the objective. And obviously that affects tone of voice, but people don't usually learn about tone of voice or how to use their voice to really express how they feel. And sometimes it's detached because we learn how to stifle our voice and push our voice down for many, many different reasons. Um, okay. So let me just see where you're at. Okay. So now we're going to play a game. I'm going to say a sentence and you are going to tell me how it sounds like. Does it sound like, what is the mood? I'm not going to give you any clues, but what is the mood that is associated with how I say it? Okay. So if you had to put a, an emotion or a feeling to what I'm saying, then um, write it down. Okay. Can I get a cup of coffee? Can I get a cup of coffee? You can also write the sentence down and then tell me what is my tone of voice? Can I get a cup of coffee? Right. I'm ordering. I'm rushing. Okay. Upset is more like it. Arrogant, mad. Right. You wouldn't say that I'm completely lovable and um, friendly, right? So whatever annoyed, agitated, good. It's a good vocabulary practice too. Demanding, Lore, very good. Good. Impatient. Can I get a cup of coffee? Right? Now, I'm I'm saying it. So like what affects my tone of voice is a few things. I also have my facial expression. I can't detach it. So obviously it's affecting. I'll try to say it with a smile. Can I get a cup of coffee? Okay. It worked. So it's my facial expression. It's the intonation, how I drop down at the end. Can I get a cup of coffee? Right? There is something about this intonation that makes it sound more demanding, more assertive, more arrogant, someone said, right? And also like the quality of my voice, right? Can I get a cup of coffee, right? If I say it like that with the same music, but my voice is a little softer, then you wouldn't feel that it's as arrogant. So there is something very tight about my voice. This is what happens when you yell as well, right? Good. How can we say that in a friendly way? Now I want you to do it yourself. Speak to the camera, speak to me. I'm listening. I can hear you. Technology, <laughs> right? And see what happens. First of all, do it in an aggressive, like arrogant, um, impatient way. Can I get a cup of coffee? So try to imitate that. And now turn it into a friendly tone. Before I say it, I want to hear you say it. I can't really hear you, but let's pretend that I can. Okay. Good. <laughs> hey, can I get a cup of coffee? Okay, what did I do differently? Can I get, okay, I'll drop the hey. Can I get a cup of coffee? Can I get a cup of coffee? So obviously facial expression. My voice is a little higher, softer, and I raise the pitch at the end. So it's kind of like more asking than demanding because people associate that rising pitch at the end with a question rather than the dropping pitch that is more assertive and certainty, which is a good thing to know if you want to sound more assertive. Hey, can I get a cup of coffee? I know I smiled. See that it works even without me smiling. Hey, can I get a cup of coffee? Okay, good. Um, I'm going to say another sentence. So you can write both the sentence and the meaning. What do you mean? What do you mean? What's going on here? What's the tone? What do you mean? Surprise. Good. Robbie. Curious. Yeah. Surprised. 
What do you mean? Good. Now, I want you to practice it with me and think about what's happening with the voice. What do you mean? Right? Like, a, it's a little whispery. What do you mean? Very pitchy, like up and down. Oh, my God. I can't believe you're saying that. Right? Which is usually associated with this surprise. I, oh, my God. Like, she was telling me all these things. Right? Notice like how we associate certain intonation patterns with an emotion or an attitude. And how if we don't listen to it and look for it, how we might miss out on so much information that is not in the words. And when we are speaking, which is even more important, how expressive are we really if we don't use our voice to its full potential? And this is why when I teach my students in, in my program, New Sound, for example, then like there is an entire module about the voice that where I teach people how to optimize their voice and how to understand to use their, how to understand how to use their voice. I missed, there was a word missing there so that they become more expressive and improve their communication skills. Cause I think it's so important and that's beyond the language, right? Okay. What do you mean? Or I'll try another one. What do you mean? What is that? What do you mean? You don't want to, you don't want to get in my way when I speak this way. What do you mean? No, tell me, what do you mean by saying that? Right. I'm angry. I'm straightforward. I'm very direct. What do you mean? What do you mean? I won the Oscars. What do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? Right? Notice the reduction there as well. Good. And I hope you're practicing with me. And it's not just like me illustrating my very unpracticed acting skills. Okay. I'm going to say one more phrase and, um, you're going to tell me, you're going to give me suggestions on how to say it. So the phrase is have a nice weekend, have a nice weekend. Now give me ideas on how to say it. What tone of voice would you like me to say it? And then we're all going to practice it together. And I'm listening, you guys, I'm listening. Okay. Listening to you from your computer screens. Um, what was the sentence that I just said? How's your day going? Or have a nice week, have a, have a nice weekend. I remembered because I wanted to talk about the have a, have a, have a, have a. Polite. Okay, let's try polite. Have a nice weekend. Oh, have a nice weekend. Upset. Have a nice weekend. <laughs> That makes me have a nice weekend. Like I'm wondering what the situation needs to be for me to say it this way. Oh, have a nice weekend. All right. Um, let's see. Let's see. Wishful. I like that. Abby. Have a nice weekend. I really want you to have a nice weekend. Have a nice weekend. So notice that the more positive tones are usually softer. The voice is softer. The pitch is higher, right? Versus more aggressive, direct, um, what people perceive as negative. I don't want to say that direct or aggressive is negative because sometimes we need to be aggressive. Sometimes we need to be aggressive, okay? Sometimes we need to be direct, we don't want to always be friendly and that is okay. And that's another great way to, to be able to control your voice or to, to be in contact with your voice. Um, okay. Have a nice weekend. Have a, have a, have a, have a, have a, have a. One more phrase. Um, okay. I think that's it. Let's answer some questions. Oh, sarcasm. Have a nice weekend. Have a nice weekend. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's going to happen. Have a nice weekend. Sarcasm is usually so, so associated with glottal fry. Yeah. 
okay. Or low tone, yeah, have a nice weekend. Yeah, right? So we do that, have a nice weekend. When we are sarcastic and usually the pitch goes down. All right, I'm, I think I'm having too much fun. So we need to move into questions. If you just recently joined, uh, joined us, then hello. This is the third day out of the five-day pronunciation training. Just so you know, on day five, I'm only going to go live on Instagram. I'm going to go live every single day at the same time. So at this time for the next two days, um, day five is about live coaching. So I'm going to coach people on their pronunciation, and I can only do it on Instagram um, cause I can bring people live. So make sure you join me on Instagram and tomorrow I'm going to give you some pronunciation hacks, things that you probably never learned in school. So make sure you join. So that's coming up in the next two days and I'm giving you tools to use pronunciation so that you can speak English with clarity, confidence, and freedom. And if you want to go even deeper, then make sure you sign up for my free class on how to make your English pronunciation simple and clear. If you're on Instagram, just write the word class on YouTube and Facebook. You can write it as well. Send me a PM or click the link. Okay, questions. Mm, someone asked if I train one-on-one -on -one for one hour. I don't teach one-on-one -on -one anymore. I only teach in my programs. I have a new sound and I have beyond, and this is where I coach. And I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one within group sessions. So I do hot seats in my programs. Um, when is the next live? The next live is tomorrow at the same time, minus 47 minutes. Okay, let's see if we have any questions. Um, is it possible to get rid of a Slavic accent? So first I'm going to say that I know you're not going to like it, but I think that the choice of words to get rid means that there is a problem with having an accent. Now, I know that some of you might say, yeah, 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 yeah. I know what you mean. Like, yeah. But no, really. You you know, when I learned uh, pronunciation, it was more about acquiring another accent that I can use it whenever I want rather than getting rid because there is nothing wrong about your pronunciation. And language is important because when you think that it makes you feel like there is something wrong with how you sound. And when you feel like there is something wrong with how you sound, then you might speak less or feel sh ashamed or embarrassed to speak, which is not going to help you not improve your pronunciation, but also not help you improve your fluency and your confidence and your connections with others. If you want to acquire another accent or to speak in a way that helps you sound clearer, right? And get what you want, then yes, you can absolutely do that. But putting into practice all the things that I've taught you, it's like the tip of the iceberg. I know because there is a lot of work that needs to be put into acquiring a new accent, learning the sounds, learning the intonation, rhythm, and stress. But also it's a lot of fun because it's like, it's understanding your voice. It's really like using your sounds in a new way, exploring and discovering what's possible for you. And it's only up to you and you can do it, right? Like, and it's, it's really so interesting and so much fun and helps you become more expressive in your first language as well. And a better communicator in your first language as well. Definitely in English and all this work can help you improve your fluency as well. Um, so the answer is yes, you just need a method and a clear step-by-step -step, uh, process to follow. I do talk about it in the live class, so make sure you sign up. Um, questions, other questions. Any tips for shadowing and accent and intonation reduction for um, intonation reduction purposes? I've been trying, but found it really difficult. So Gwen is asking. I actually have a video about shadowing. So if you haven't watched it, I recommend that you watch it because I teach you how to practice shadowing, but in an intentional way. So you're only focusing on specific things. So it has, um, I have two videos. One is how shadowing, what is shadowing and how to practice shadowing. And one is how to uh, practice effectively. And I do it with um, a clip from Wednesday Adams, from Wednesday, from the show Wednesday. Okay. 
So you can go deeper there, but technically speaking, shadowing is it means that you're repeating someone else. Either you play and pause and then you repeat, or you just shadow, right? Like speak on top of someone else. And you want to make sure that you're imitating certain elements because you can't imitate it a hundred percent. So if you want to practice connected speech, then make sure that you um, just focus on connected speech. If you want to practice reductions, notice the places that are reduced and then repeat them several times. So don't go for quantity, go for quality. A lot of times people want to do a lot and then they just, they don't get the impact that this work can have. Take a short, like 30 second segment and do it again and again. And every time try to discover something new about the pronunciation, about the pitch, about the intonation, the connected speech, and you will see that it's a lot easier for you. And if you do shadowing and you want to, and it's hard for you, then grab the script. So do a TED talk or go to, you know, watch a clip where you have the script of the text of the video that you're watching. And that is also going to make it a lot easier. You don't have to figure it out all on your own. Don't make it hard on you. Make it easy so you can focus on what matters. In your case, Gwen, it's reductions. I've been recording, Milena says, I've been recording myself every day and I noticed that I improved my pronunciation a lot. Uh, I'm so happy that you're saying that because yes, like this is a fundamental way for improving your pronunciation and fluency and everything about your English because you need to understand your performance to be able to improve it, right? It's kind of like, you know, how do you expect football players or soccer players to improve if they don't know what they're actually doing on the field. So they need to watch how they play and then understand their patterns and then change them. We do the same with when we practice pronunciation, and this is why recording yourself is really important. Any websites with practice that you recommend? Yes, it's called hadarshemesh.com. It happens to be my website. I'm a bit biased, but I don't know. I think it's a great website to practice. There are a lot of videos, especially videos about sounds with a free download. So there is a free PDF with words, phrases, and sentences and audio practice, a ton of free resources. Go check it out. Okay. Um, mm -mm -mm. I like your accent very much. How can I get that skill? Please tell me. Well, I... I'm teaching you everything that I know in my videos, where I teach you everything that I know in my videos, but also in those five days, I give you the highlights, the 20%. So pay attention, watch the recordings, save them, okay? And make sure you sign up for my live class because in the live class, I'm going to teach you the steps to get to where I am today. I'm a non-native speaker of English and everything that I teach you um, is based on my own experience. Imitation is not working for me as I forget words to work with while speaking the speech. Work with a text. Don't try to remember it. The purpose is not for you to remember it. The purpose is for you to imitate. So it's really impossible to think of the melody, the sounds, the words, the grammar, because obviously subconsciously you think about it, and to remember everything. Impossible. Take the text, take a video, and then do those imitation exercises and repeat it as many times as you need. If you don't get it the first time, do it the second time, the third time, the fourth time till you get it. Okay. Sorry. Just reading sweet comments. Um, where can I get the videos from? Ted, Ted.com. You have a lot of, uh, Ted talks with the script and it's like a dynamic script. So it's really easy. Um, there are a lot of websites that offer you clips with a script. Just Google it. I think it's it's um, it's easy to find these days. When I started this work, it was so hard to find a script and a video. Now we have it everywhere. Okie dokie. All right. Um, Devin says, I always forget vocabulary words from newspaper, how to improve myself for to remember those words for the long run, go check out my, my video on 
how to memorize new words or how to, how to improve your vocabulary. It's called how to improve your vocabulary. Stop learning new words. This is where I share my step-by-step, -step, um, plan on how to improve your vocabulary. And the only thing that I'm going to tell you here is make sure that you don't try to memorize every new word that you see, especially on the paper, because a lot of times in the paper, they use very fancy words that you don't use regularly. So don't spend all your brain space and capacity on um, learning something you're less likely to use in your day-to-day -day life. So also the words that you choose to learn should be like words that you actually need, especially when, when you're not you don't have a lot of experience using and speaking English. Okay, good. All right, my friends, I think that's it. How do I know? Okay, this is a really good question. How do I know what word to stress or reduce? So first of all, you have that distinction between content words and function words. Content words, verbs, nouns, adjectives, and adverbs are usually words that we tend to stress versus function words on an ad, could, would, should, all those small words that don't have a significant meaning on their own, those words are usually reduced. Now, it really depends on the speaker and what you're trying to say. You have a strong intuition when it relates to what you want to say. You have it in your first language, and it's the same in English. Don't doubt yourself. You have to believe that you you know what, what the important word in the sentence is. It's the same in your first language. It's not any different in English. What I do want you to explore is that if you have intonation patterns or stress patterns in your first language, you might be bringing them into English, and as a result, you might stress words that are less likely to be stressed, like the word like function words at the end of words, at the end of sentences, like words like it or him that are usually unstressed. Okay, so sometimes we do you like bring our patterns from our first language. But generally speaking, when you are communicating, you probably know what the key word in the sentence is. Okay? And those are, this is probably the word that you need to emphasize. But a good way to see or to kind of like map out how it's being, how, what, what's typical in English or um, how people usually ch um, choose their stress patterns, just do listening exercises and see how it's different than, you know, how you would interpret it. Okay, good. Um, I think that's it. Fado is asking, do I need to practice or listen to other accents? I can't understand UK accent rather than American accent. It's so difficult to understand. First of all, if you are asking this question, you probably know the answer. Because if you struggle with understanding a UK accent, then it's a problem for you, right? Like maybe you are watching a show that, you know, like where they speak with the British accent. Maybe you live in the UK. Maybe you want to, like, to, to, to communicate to expand your ability to communicate with different people from around the world. So if that is a challenge, then absolutely. If you want to get better at understanding people with a certain accent, whether it's a native English accent, British, American, Australian, or a non-native accent, you know, maybe you work with a different country and you work with a lot of people who speak a certain language and you have trouble understanding them, just expose yourself to that accent and your brain will get used to it. You can teach your brain how to listen better, how to understand others. Okay. While we work on changing ourselves, because you can't change anyone else, right? You can't expect someone to understand you better by being more attentive. You can say that, but you can't control how they think, you know, if they discriminate non-native speakers, like you can't control that. So you can only control what you do. And this is why I teach what I teach, because I, I think that understanding all those elements give you power. And I would teach that to native and non-native speakers. At the same time, you can also work on being a better listener, right? And improving your listening abilities, understanding different accents, right? That's power, being able to listen and understand different people because that's how the world is. Not everyone has a general American accent. Not everyone speaks 
English as their native language. And you will hear a lot of variety and exposing yourself to different accents is a great thing. Okay. So how do you do that? Just listening exercises like you would do. And I have lessons about how to understand better, better lessons. I have videos about how to understand other speakers better. And that includes people with different accents. Okay. You can check it out on YouTube. All right, my friends, I will see you tomorrow. Thank you so, so much for being here today, for participating, for being so incredibly awesome, answering questions, challenging me to speak with different tones. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, I hope to see you here tomorrow. Okay. Because I'm going to be here at the same time, minus one hour. And also, if you want to sign up for my live class, I feel like I said that 10 times. But if you just joined now, I have a live class next Tuesday. All right, my friends, love you all. Thank you so, so much. Take care. If you haven't watched the first two videos, go watch it. It's on my account. All right. Bye, everyone.